Good evening to you one and all. Lovely to have you with us here this evening. And to those I've not had the opportunity to say it already, a very happy Easter to you. Uh, delighted to be able to share our worship together on this Easter Sunday evening with one and all. So a very warm welcome to you. And as always, those of you joining us online, we're glad to welcome you as well, uh, wherever you may be and whatever your circumstances, we do pray that the Lord would really uh, bless you and encourage you and afford you much uh, comfort and strength in sharing with us tonight in our worship. So welcome to you as well. We're going to begin our worship. We stand to sing and the words will always be on the screen uh, behind me. And uh, we're going to stand to sing, Come, People of the Risen King. Let us worship God. Uh, bow now in prayer together. Let us all pray. And it is, living God, it is to rejoice that we gather, to rejoice in all that you are, because although our circumstances can vary enormously, although there's so much uncertainty in the world in which we live and so much that is confusing, we're glad that you don't change. You remain the same forever. And you demonstrate and reveal to us that you are altogether wise, you're altogether mighty, there's nothing that you're not able to do, and you have been pleased in your kindness and in your mercy to look with pity upon the world that you made, and you have come in the person of your son Jesus, and come in the most extraordinary manner to do for us as one of us what we could never do ourselves and live that sort of life that we should have lived but none of us have and then die that sort of death that all of us should be but now no, don't need to be dying, one of utter God-forsakenness. And we're glad in the knowledge that 
We celebrate every Sunday, but this Sunday in particular, that you raised Jesus from the dead uh, quite, quite remarkably, wonderfully. And uh, now that same Jesus about whom we read, he went around doing good and went around effecting change in people's lives and, and meeting them in their need. We're glad that he's risen alive at work in the world in which we live today and one whom we also may know ourselves. So we're glad to come here this evening, uh, lovely afternoon and evening. We gladly bring you our praise as our creator, glad of the world in which we live, glad that you've made us the way we are, that we have eyes to see and ears to hear, and the capacity to enjoy so many good things in the world in which we live but glad above all else that in Jesus you have come and you bring about that change in our lives. And we ask simply that as we gather here, as we read your words, we hear that word, and as it is proclaimed later, that you would speak with us, make yourself known to us, and grant that we may be conscious of your presence with us, your hand upon us, your love for us, and may go in your strength to live lives that are indeed for your praise and glory. So help us in our worship that it may be pleasing and honoring to you. And we ask it through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Well, we're going to turn to read from the Bible. And uh, Roger is going to come and read the passage for us this evening. We'll have the words on the screen for you as well, so you can follow there. Um, but if you want to use your own Bible, either uh, a mobile or whatever it is you happen to use, um, it's John chapter 20, and you keep your finger in the place because we'll come back to it shortly. Good evening. Tonight's reading is, I'm just checking... John chapter 20, verses 19 to 31. This is the word of the Lord. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later... His disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Amen. Well, as I say, we'll come back to uh, have a look at that passage um, just a little bit later, but we're going to join to sing again to God's praise this Easter Sunday evening. 
Uh, we're going to join to sing a, a lovely old hymn, Jesus Christ is Risen Today, and it has at the end of every line the word hallelujah, which simply means praise the Lord. We're, we're meant to celebrate uh, all that God has done for us in Jesus. Let's then join together to bring him our praise. Jesus Christ is risen today. Hallelujah. a seat. And as we uh, turn to the Bible, um, we uh, believe the Bible to be very much God's own Word that He breathed out long since, and it still retains, therefore, that uh, astonishing capacity, that power that belongs to God to speak life into our lives. And so, as we turn to uh, look at the passage that Roger read and learn from it. We're going to ask that the Lord would indeed simply do that all over again and speak to each of us according to our needs. Let's join and ask him to do that now. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you that in the very beginning when you spoke that word and said, let there be light, there was light, so that what you spoke became the reality and as we, therefore, turn this evening to learn from your word, we'd ask simply that by your own mighty Holy Spirit, it would be like light erupting into darkness, that you would speak that word of life into all that is dead in our lives, that we might find ourselves to be made truly alive and able to live lives that have significance, lives that uh, make a difference, lives in which we're conscious of your presence, know your love, and enjoy the help of your risen Son. So be with us now and speak with us, we pray, for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. 
Well, we uh, do always simply make a lot of Jesus. Um, he is the focus for all that we are and all that we do and all that we're about. And the whole Bible really is written uh, in order to help us get some idea as to who he is, what he does, why he matters, and how you and I can come to know him. And although for many folk today, um, the very name Jesus means little or nothing and is perhaps little more than an occasional swear word that uh, they use or they hear other people using, in reality, this Jesus is uh, the most documented individual in ancient history. He is an individual whose life clearly impacted not only the people of his own day and generation, but people in every nation and in every continent of the, the world in which we live down through all the generations. And we ignore him in many ways at our peril because if what the Bible has to say about him is true, if what Christians down the years have declared about him is the reality, then we would be foolish to miss out on this. And, uh, and it's really with that in mind that we, we tend to look at the passage that Roger read for us this evening from John chapter 20. John was one of the original followers of Jesus, as you're perhaps aware, and uh, he had been with Jesus. He was originally a fisherman, but he'd followed Jesus, uh, traipsed through the length and breadth of the land, seen the things that Jesus had done, uh, heard the things that Jesus had taught, encountered the people that Jesus met and changed, and he comes now to, towards the end of his life to write up the record of of who this Jesus is and the things that he has done. And one of the, the particular features of John in writing and narrating what the ministry of Jesus looked like is that while the, the other gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, um, give to us essentially the, the kind of uh, recorded highlights of the ministry of Jesus, what John is doing is, is effectively that of the pundit who says, um, we're just going to slow this moment down and we're going to look at this, we're going to zoom in, slow it down and have a look at what is going on here. And he concentrates on a, a smaller number of uh, very important, significant moments in the life and ministry of Jesus and does so uh, very deliberately, he says, as he explains in the, the last couple of verses of the passage that Roger read, he does so in order that you and I might believe certain things to be the truth about Jesus and that by that believing, we might have life in his name. And so it is important really to get a hold of this, that the, the whole purpose behind what John is writing here and the whole purpose essentially behind the Bible is that you and I might actually enjoy life. Um, the way that it's, it's kind of flagged up in the Bible is sometimes it's a new life. Um, it is new in the sense that it's fresh, it is vital, and it is different from the, the mere existence that we have been uh, experiencing in our lives. So it is a new life. That's one way in which it's described. A second way in which it's described is as a full life or an abundant life. And uh, that, uh, that fullness uh, in terms of our whole experience, the, the fullness of our enjoyment of God, the fullness of our enjoyment of God's presence and God's love and God's purpose in our lives, it's described not only as new life, but an abundant life, and it's also spoken of as an eternal life. Um, it is a life that is bigger, that is stronger than uh, death itself, and a life that will endure through all the circumstances of this earthly life, even through death itself. Death itself can't hold us, and the life that we have in Jesus is a life that is eternal. And so you've got to kind of be daft not to be at least interested to find out um, a little bit more about this life that is new, that is abundant, and that is eternal. And that's what John is, is writing to help you and I uh, be able to enjoy that life. That you may believe, and by believing, you may have life in his name. And there are, therefore, uh, in the passage that Roger read, there are the, these two basic components. Um, it's a, an unequal division in the passage, but verses 19 to 23, if you have a Bible open in front of you, um, if you don't, then just trust me, um, that was what Roger read, and if you've got a good memory, you'll be able to remember that he read these verses. 19 to 23 
is helping you and I uh, understand what this life is, what it's like, why, why it is uh, uh, worth our while discovering and knowing for ourselves. And then verses 24 to the end explain how you and I can know that life, how we come to experience that life in day-by-day uh, -day, uh, living. And that's basically the way this passage uh, breaks up and the way that we're going to look at it this evening. It starts in verses 19 to 23 with the very first Easter Sunday evening. They didn't call it that, obviously, then, because they, they weren't even aware that that was what was going on. But uh, the very first Easter Sunday evening, the, the night on which Jesus was raised from the dead. And uh, it starts with this um, encounter as the, the followers of Jesus, they're in the upper room, they're gathered together there, they have the door locked, very firmly locked, because they're frightened, and Jesus meets with them. And in that encounter that uh, um, they have with Jesus, uh, that takes them completely by surprise, um, they were not expecting it at all, um, it was um, just astonishing for them, uh, but in that encounter with him, uh, we discover what that life now is going to be like for these uh, early followers of Jesus. And, and I've sometimes put it like this, that it's helpful to think of this as, as kind of four compass points, um, the north, south, east, and west of the, the new, abundant, eternal life that we come to know and enjoy in Jesus. They all begin with P, and that makes them easily to remember. And strikingly, they're all here in these for um, four or five verses. Um, the first P is simply peace. You see, that's the first word that Jesus speaks. He speaks it again, and he speaks it yet again as well. It's kind of like every time Jesus opens his mouth, it is peace that is being imparted. Every time he appears, every time he is present with the people, it is peace that he brings. And uh, that's an important part of of our human experience, because very often that's not what we enjoy. The disciples here up in the upper room, they certainly were not enjoying peace. They were worried sick, they were sad to the core, and they were terrified silly. That's a, that's a, a lethal cocktail of emotions that is going on, that is churning them up, and if it had gone on like that for too long, I imagine they'd have had a few ulcers, because that's a bad combination. Deep, deep grief, Huge, huge worry and great, great fear. All of that packaged together, there they are in the upper room like that, and the last thing on their mind is peace. It's not peace that they are enjoying. It is sorrow, it is pain, it is worry, it is fear. And into that, Jesus comes and his first word is peace. It is the Hebrew shalom that he is speaking into their experience. And you'll see as you, you kind of read through the passage there that you have that, um, first of all, in verse 19, Jesus stood among them and said, peace. Again, verse 21, Jesus said, peace be with you. And verse uh, 26, uh, the, the following Sunday evening, uh, his first words to them again, peace be with you. As if to kind of underline for you and me that that, first of all, is, uh, is what Jesus Christ brings into your experience. And you, like me, and like pretty much everyone else in the world in which we live, there are so many things that go on in the big bad world out there, and so many things that go on in our own personal world that do occasion fear, that do occasion pain, that do occasion grief, that do occasion worry. Um, we, we, we know all about that. There are pressures, there are problems, there are stresses. We experience them. And, uh, and often the, the, the whole combination of these is such that we, we would love that somehow someone would be able to sort it all out. And that's what Jesus comes to do, to bring peace into our experience, uh, a kind of wholeness to our, our whole experience. Uh, and, and his presence all the way through the, the records that we, we have in, in Matthew's account and Mark's account and Luke's account of the ministry of Jesus, when he pitches up, um, peace prevails. The most classic, I suppose, illustration of that, that storm that there was when these fishermen were out on the Lake of Galilee, Jesus in the boat, fast asleep in the back of the boat, and, and they are terrified, silly. They are worried, sick, 
um, about the storm. They, they, they don't know how to cope with this. They're fearful that they will drown. And they wake him up, and Jesus simply stands up in the midst of the boat and says to the waves, to the, the wind, says, peace, be still. Boom. Flat calm. Um, that's, that's a graphic illustration of the impact that this Jesus has in the lives, in the experiences, in the storms that come our way. He brings a peace. And he brings a peace in terms of our relationship with God, because often those are the sorts of things that trouble us. Uh, the anxiety that we have because of things that we have done, we're ashamed of them, we regret them, we can't undo them, we can't wind the clock back. We wish sometimes we could because we would do things differently, but it's done, it's dusted, and we wonder, is that going to affect everything? We wonder whether that disqualifies us. And the good news of Jesus is he, he brings a peace in our relationship with God, the enjoyment of complete forgiveness. Uh, that's the first P. That's the first compass point about this life. Um, and, and that's why we, we are always keen to commend that new, abundant, eternal life that is found in Jesus to you. This is what it's like. Uh, it's marked, first of all, by peace. The second uh, compass point that we discover is uh, what I'm going to uh, call simply pleasure. And um, that pleasure is, is a very genuine pleasure. People sometimes think that following Jesus must be pretty dull. You know, you can end religion in these dark, dingy buildings and people who go around without a smile on their face, without a laugh on their head, and, uh, and often just kind of dressed in black like that. Is, is that what it's all about? And the answer is no, it's nothing like that at all. Um, there's a brightness, there's a vitality, there is a joy, because there is a joy in the heart of God himself. And it was that joy that Jesus meant that his followers should have, should experience, that they too would be able to share the joy, he says, that I have, um, the joy that he's had from all eternity, he says, the, the joy and the pleasure of, of being able to share in the creative work of God Almighty. Uh, we get a glimpse of that in the book of Proverbs in the Old Testament there, the picture there of Jesus in chapter 8, uh, simply enjoying the sheer fun, the sheer pleasure of bringing a world into being. And, uh, and yeah, that, that must be something pretty, pretty stunningly pleasurable about, uh, about sharing in, in the activity of the living God like that as he, as he puts the stars in place and names them all and makes sure that they're all in their right galaxy and things like that. Uh, what a pleasure that is in being able to, to, to use our time and our lives sharing in that work of creation in that sort of manner. There is a joy that he knows and it's a deep-seated joy uh, that is rooted in, in his relationship with his father and that finds expression in all that he is. Uh, there is nothing dour about Jesus. Uh, whatever caricature you may have come across of him, nothing dour about him, nothing dull about him at all. There is simply that joy that is his, and he means that his followers should have it. And you'll see here, his disciples were overjoyed. Um, uh, not just happy, not just joyful, but they were overjoyed. Um, there, was, uh, there was joy that was on steroids, as it were, turbocharged joy in their hearts and in their experience. And you can, you can understand why that's the case. They had followed Jesus. They had, they had loved being with Jesus. They loved the things that he did. They loved the things that he taught. They loved the way that he handled people. They, they, had, they had reveled in these years that he'd spent with him, and then they'd seen him crucified. They'd seen him dead, buried in that tomb, and they concluded, like most of us would have concluded, that's it, just a sad, sad end to this particular story. And, and to find that this Jesus now in the room with them, risen from the dead, alive, uh, you can understand it's a joy that erupts in their hearts when you read through the, uh, the New Testament documents there, the uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the, the record of the ministry that Jesus exercised. You see the things that he did. Um, you would want to have him with you. You would want to be with him when he goes around and does the things that he does and changes people's lives the way that he changes people's lives and teaches the things that he does and, and is able to know how to handle every situation, every difficulty that arises and address it all and resolve it all. You'd be glad to have him with you. And, and that's his desire, that, that we might have that joy in being with him. And so the, the second part of this new life that we come to know in Jesus is that pleasure. 
uh, Psalm 16 ends on that note. Uh, it's a lovely Psalm, Psalm 16, that essentially uh, speaks about the life of the believer, the experience of the believer, uh, through all the trials that there are, through all the difficulties that may come our way. Uh, nonetheless, the bottom line is that we enjoy his presence. You alone, Lord, are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The lines have fallen more for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful heritage. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad. My tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. That's the second um, component then in the new life that the Lord Jesus comes to give to those who are his followers. Um, it's a good life. It's a new life, an abundant life. Peace, first of all, and then pleasure, uh, lasting and enduring pleasure beyond all measure. There is a joy in following the Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't mean there aren't going to be problems. It doesn't mean there aren't going to be pains. It doesn't mean there's not going to be suffering. It doesn't mean there's not going to be a cost. But there is a deep-seated joy that nothing can remove. The third component of this new life is purpose. You see how Jesus speaks to the uh, followers here and says to them, in, uh, in verse 21, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Um, he has work for us to do, in other words. And he, he is calling these folk, he is calling them to share with him in what he is doing. And what he's doing is something that big that um, it, it spans eternity itself. Um, it's that big, it's that significant. It is something that originated way back in the councils of eternity as, uh, as he with the Father, they, they planned and purposed something monumental, not only the creation of the world, but also the, the, the saving, the rescuing, the most um, astonishing, transformational, uh, cosmic-sized transformation that he was going to effect. And he bids us be a part of that. Um, as the Father has sent me, so I'm sending you. He says, I, I give your life that purpose. I give your life that direction. And uh, all of a sudden, we discover that our lives now, no matter who we are, as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, they have direction, they have purpose, they have significance, they have meaning. And for a lot of folk, that's, that's really good news because it can feel often that our lives are actually going nowhere in particular. We don't really know what they're about. Uh, we kind of figure that we've got a certain number of years probably. We don't know quite how many we're going to have, but, but exactly how we're going to use them, what they, they're for, often we are struggling to, to kind of figure that out. Why am I here? What am I here for? I, I don't want somebody to get to the end of my life and figure out that I've just frittered the whole thing away and done nothing and accomplished nothing of any consequence at all. I want my life to have purpose. I want my life to have meaning, to have direction. And it's that that Jesus gives. He says, come follow me. Uh, come be part of something that is big, that is monumental in scope, that is uh, indeed intent on bringing about a massive rescue uh, that sees men, women, girls, boys transformed, that sees the whole uh, cosmos, the whole environment transformed. That's, that's what he's about, and he says, come join me and do that with me. So that's the third component, third compass point. I don't know whether it's north, south, east, or west, but it's one of them. Uh, the peace, first of all, and then there's pleasure, and then there's purpose, and then finally, there is also power. Um, and uh, not only does he say to his followers there, as the Father has sent me, so I'm sending you, he then breathes on them in this, uh, this wonderfully graphic, visual sort of way uh, and, and says to them, in case they miss what's going on, he says, so receive the Holy Spirit. And uh, that, that will become for them an ever-deepening reality that uh, uh, the early chapters of the book of Acts explains for us. The Spirit of God himself coming upon 
ordinary individuals like you and me, no matter who we are, no matter what our past may be, no matter how ungifted we may think we are, no matter how crazy we may be, uh, no matter how insignificant we may be, uh, it is the promise that God gives to all who trust in his son. He pours out his Holy Spirit and says, um, he's yours, uh, so that by his Holy Spirit, he comes to live in the hearts of his people. That's God in all his greatness, all his power, all his majesty. That great, mighty, all-powerful God comes to live in his people. And we find ourselves, therefore, empowered by God himself through his Holy Spirit to live lives that are going to be able to make a difference, that are going to be able to move forward the purpose of God. And that's what Jesus is pointing to here. It is life that he means that they should know a life that is marked by peace, by pleasure, by purpose, and by power. That's the new life. And uh, the whole Bible is, is really designed to urge you to, to discover that life that God means that you and I should have. Not an existence, not just uh, footering around for however many years our earthly life is, but actually a life that is pulsing and throbbing with the presence of God, with the, uh, the love of God, with the power of God, and sharing in the purpose of God as well. It's that life that he means we should know. And uh, John's gospel is, is uh, just chock full of that. Uh, the very beginning, which we often read at Christmas, uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and all things that were made were made by him. In him was life. And uh, so you, you get in those first, uh, those, those kind of four words, you get the essence of what the whole record that John is, is giving is about. In him, Jesus, in him was life. You want to know that life? It's in him. Um, uh, when he writes later on one of his letters, the, the first letter, when he gets to chapter 5 of that, he will say, this is basically the message, not complicated. This is the message that God has given. Uh, God has given us eternal life, and that life is in his Son, Jesus. He who has the, the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God doesn't have life. You may exist, but you don't have that life. It's in him. In him was life. John chapter 1, the first few verses there. When you get halfway through John's gospel, John chapter 10, and at verse 10, uh, this is not 2020 version, this is 1010 version, John chapter 10, verse 10, halfway through the gospel, in case we have forgotten, Jesus himself says, I have come that they may have life and have it in all its fullness. That's why I'm here, said Jesus. That's what I'm about, that you, no matter who you are, might enjoy that life. And here, John, at the end here, he is saying, and all these things that I've written are written so that you might believe that this is the truth about Jesus, that he is the Messiah, that he is the Son of God, and that by believing that about him and entrusting yourself to him, you might have life. That life that is marked by peace, by pleasure, by purpose, and by power. And so you are asking yourself, how do I get it? Good question. John takes us on, winds the thing on to the following week. And verses 24 to 31 point us to this. You'll see right at the very end uh, in verse 30, he says, um, uh, Jesus performed uh, many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. So he's, he's saying this, this, that I, this that I have recorded is kind of like a sign. Um, uh, it happened, but it also tells you a lot about who Jesus is, a lot about what Jesus has done. And there are lots of these events in the life of Jesus that kind of flag up for you who he is, what he's done, why he matters, and how you and I can get to know him. Here's one of them, he's saying. And the ones that I've, I have recorded, he said, these signs that I've recorded in my book, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah and the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So his intent here is to help us recognize who he is, recognize what he's done, and seeing that, understanding that, entrust ourselves to him because as we do that we find that actually we we have embarked on life that new life that is abundant 
And so what, what John helpfully does for us here is he gives to us a case study in this man, Thomas. Um, and we're told straight off three things about Thomas. Uh, the first is that he is known as Didymus. Um, and um, whether that was uh, a kind of nickname or whatever um, is not clear. Uh, quite often people um, assume that it, it means he was a twin, you know, and there was a twin brother or sister somewhere along the line, but we, we don't uh, know who that is. Um, the word Didymus can mean a twin, but it can also mean um, double-minded. It can mean someone who, who's kind of um, uh, in two minds about something and who is maybe a little bit indecisive because they, they can kind of see it clearly one day and then the next day, but they've got all sorts of problems with it. And Thomas, um, it may have been that he was, he was just that sort of person. He's, you know, kind of two minds about things. And that's why he got nicknamed Didymus, because he was always like that. Whatever may be the case in terms of his nickname, uh, he was, we're told, one of the twelve. Um, down to 11, obviously, by this stage, but one of the 12. That's to say he was one of those who had uh, been glad to give up pretty much everything to follow Jesus, to be with Jesus, to travel with Jesus where he went, and he had, he had taken that step of commitment. Uh, he maybe had a whole load of questions, a whole load of struggles, a whole load of doubts in his own mind, but, but he'd taken that step. He'd said, yeah, I, I, I want to be part of, of what's going on with this Jesus. So he was one of the 12. And the third thing that we're told about him was that he wasn't there uh, on Easter Sunday evening. He missed the boat. He missed out on that remarkable event that took place when the disciples, for the very first time, as they gathered there in that upper room, they encountered the fact that Jesus is risen. They met him. They saw him. They heard him. They touched him. They knew Jesus is indeed risen from the dead and alive again. And, uh, and Thomas had missed out on that. Um, we're not told what the reason was, uh, whether he was kind of watching Manchester City play Arsenal and, uh, you know, kind of forgot that there was a, a meeting of the disciples on or because he was, uh, you know, he was just uh, ill or we're not told at all. So it's pointless speculating as to why he wasn't there. He just wasn't there when that happened on that first uh, Sunday evening. And uh, here, when we do find him, he, he has this, this great line when they say, we've seen the Lord, and he says to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails are and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. That's kind of reassuring for us because here's a guy who in, in some ways is, he kind of gets it, he's, uh, he's been ready and glad to follow this Jesus, but at the same time, he, he kind of struggles with this notion that Jesus could be alive. He kind of admires Jesus, uh, there's no doubt about that, he's enjoyed being with Jesus, glad to have acknowledged a lot of things about Jesus, but, but the notion that Jesus, who was crucified, was dead and was buried, could possibly be alive, he's, he's kind of got struggles with that. And there would be many uh, back then and many today who have the same sort of struggle. Really, uh, I mean, when someone dies, that's pretty final. And we know that to our cost. We know that because we, we feel the pain of that. They, they are not there any longer. We, we could wish they were, but they're not. There is a, a, a real finality about death. We, we understand that. They understood that. Thomas understood that. And so he he is, is kind of reluctant to, to take on board this notion that the disciples are, are flinging at him, that they have seen him and that he's risen and alive. Um, when, you, when you track back just a little bit in John's gospel and uh, read the, the other references to the, there are to this guy Thomas, um, they shed a little bit of light on perhaps the reason why he found it difficult to believe. And, and some of you find it difficult to believe. You kind of, you get it intellectually, but uh, taking that step of actually entrusting your life to this Jesus and, and living your life on the basis that he is risen and alive and active and at work in the world in which we live today, that's just a, a kind of difficult step for you to take. 
um, Thomas is a pal for you. John chapter 11 and at verse um, 6 there, 16, we, we read that Thomas, also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, uh, let us go also that we may die with him. Uh, the backdrop to this is that um, uh, the, the friends of Jesus, um, Martha and Mary, they've sent Jesus a message saying that uh, their brother Lazarus is seriously ill. Um, and the, the subtext is, please, you know, kind of come and, and do your business with him to make him well again because uh, he's seriously ill. They send this message to Jesus. Jesus, Jesus um, doesn't go immediately. And when he does go, the, the, the other disciples are, are very quick to say, listen, it's, it's kind of crazy for you to go up to that part of, uh, of the land at this time because last time you were there, Jesus, they were intent on stoning you to death. And, and you're just going to walk straight into that sort of thing. They're going to stone you again. They're going to try and kill you again. Uh, you really sure you want to go there? And Thomas is, is saying, yeah, come on, let's go with him and, and just die with him like that. Um, he, he may have been a little bit of a pessimist. Um, it may have been that there were things in his life that had hurt him badly previously. And he, he's reluctant to be hurt again. Uh, and that can very often be the case with ourselves. We were hesitant about committing ourselves to a Jesus and, and taking a step of commitment when having done something like that previously, we find ourselves badly, badly hurt. Maybe that was part of it with Thomas, that a hesitation because he didn't want to get hurt all over again, didn't want to be disappointed all over again, didn't want to find that, that uh, um, he, he had kind of bought into something and then found that it, it just all fell flat in him all over again. Um, he'd already experienced that. He'd been following Jesus for all these years, and boom, Jesus ends up on a cross and in a tomb. He doesn't want to find that he's disappointed again. Um, a couple of chapters later, we read in John chapter 14, when Jesus gathers his followers around him, they have the, the kind of last meal together, and Jesus says to them, you know the way to the place where I'm going, and Thomas says to Jesus there, chapter 14 at verse 5, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Which suggests to me that, uh, that Thomas is quite a logical sort of guy, quite a practical sort of guy. Fine for you to come up with all this nice language. Um, um, uh, I am the way, uh, just uh, uh, come with me type of thing. You know the place where I'm going. Thomas says, we don't know where you're going. We don't know the way. How can we possibly know the way? You know, you've got to lay it out for us. Um, there is a certain um, logic in what he's saying. There is a certain practicality. And it may be there's a certain caution on his part as well. You know, we, we kind of need to know the route map before we, we set out on any path. You've got to tell us what the route map is. Um, it seems that that's the sort of guy that Thomas was. That he uh, was perhaps a little bit cautious, had perhaps been hurt a little bit in the past, and therefore is reluctant to, to take any step that exposes him to the possibility of being disappointed and hurt all over again. And here he is. And therefore he says, Un unless I see uh, the, the nail marks and uh, put my hand in his side, I will not believe. And the narrative culminates with the same Thomas coming out with this extraordinary utterance where he says, my Lord and my God, he recognizes who Jesus is, that he is the very son of God, that he is the one who brings God himself into our midst. He recognizes that he's God and he recognizes that he's the Lord. He recognizes that he is the one who brings the rule of God, who brings the word of God, who brings the grace of God, who is, uh, to, to put it all in, in one word, who is the Messiah. Who, who brings the activity of God, whereby God speaks to us, whereby God heals us, whereby God helps us and rules as he brings that into our experience. My Lord and my God. And, and that's his affirmation. And, and so we're, we're, 
um, given this illustration of a man who starts off with a, a reluctance and with a difficulty in believing that Jesus could be risen from the dead, coming to that conviction that he is risen from the dead, that he is alive, that he is the Son of God, and that he is the Messiah. Uh, and that's what John is hoping that you and I will, will do as well, that you too may believe that that's who he is, that he is God, that he is Lord, that he is the Messiah, and that by believing and trusting your life to him and following him, you will know that life. How did it happen? Um, two things, just in conclusion, that um, will, I think, be helpful for you from the narrative here. The first is simply this, be in your place with God's people. Um, that's almost invariably where it begins. That's what it was with Thomas. He was in his place with the rest of the followers of Jesus. You miss out on that at your peril. And so if you, you are eager to know this life, eager to come to that awareness that Jesus is for real, that he is risen, is alive, is at work, Make sure that you're in your place as part of that believing people because that's where he's likely to make himself known. Um, that's the first thing that we do well to recognize here. And um, that's often been the experience of different individuals. For long enough, um, I sought exactly this. I, I, I was looking for life uh, because it was an existence that I had. And I, I don't want just an existence. I wanted a life that had purpose, that had power, that had peace, that had pleasure. And, and I didn't have it. I, I don't know where to look for it either. And I had an older sister, still do have an older sister, who said to me one day, uh, come along to this church. And because she was my older sister and she who must be obeyed, I, I went the following Sunday. And, and was there, and I didn't understand a word that the guy was saying, not a word of what, what he was saying. A lovely man, and uh, he was from up these parts as well, but, but I had a clue what he was on about. But, but, I knew that whatever he was on about, this guy knew what I was after. He knew experientially. He knew what it was, and I resolved, I'm just going to be there until I get it myself. And so I was there the following Sunday and the following Sunday and then morning and evening and then morning, evening and through the week as well. I was just hungry for that, to be in the place where God's people are because that's where he makes himself known, not least. That's what Thomas found here. Uh, and the second thing is this, to hear his word. Um, if you look at the, the narrative here, it is what Jesus said to him that actually changed everything for him. It wasn't because Thomas took out his kind of forensic science kit and, and you know, said, uh, you know, we need to have a swab here, Jesus. Let me take a swab and open your mouth and I'll, I'll do that and go back to the lab. And I'll, I just want to check that it's you, Jesus. Um, and he, he didn't kind of uh, feel him all over and kind of do the, the kind of body search and check that, you know, he had moles in different places and that sort of thing. And it's the real Jesus. None of that. Jesus sim simply spoke to him and Thomas' response to his word is my Lord and my God, because he, he recognized the voice of Jesus. Peace be with you. Boom. Straight in. Thomas, I know exactly where you are. I understand where you're at. And I'm speaking to you because I know you, Thomas, and I missed you, and I want you, Thomas. So check me out if you want, but stop doubting and believe. And, and you see, that's, that's a command. And the command of Jesus imparts what it commands. So when, when Jesus stands at the, the tomb of the dead man, Lazarus, and says to a dead man, Lazarus, come out, the command has that power to, to create what is being commanded. And Lazarus comes out of the tomb. A dead man comes out of the tomb. Astonishing. So when Jesus commands Thomas here, stop doubting and believe the very command of Jesus himself imparts the capacity to Thomas to believe and he comes out with that statement of, of faith, my Lord and my God. 
and, and that's one of the, 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 the thrills, the, the adventure, part of the, the romance, part of the, the uh, surprise that there is in public worship when God's word is read and is preached. Something quite extraordinary happens. It is Jesus himself by his spirit speaking through his word and saying to you, stop doubting and believe and imparting to you with that conviction yeah, it's his voice, and it's he who's speaking, and he who bids me enter into life. It is as if he, uh, through his very word, speaks to our hearts and says, live all over again. And he bids us rise and live. And again and again, through the narrative of the ministry of Jesus, that's what he's doing. He's meeting with people who are blind and saying, open your eyes. They open their eyes and they see people who are lame, who can't, uh, can't walk, can't stand. And he says, on your feet. And he puts them on their feet. He makes people who are dead alive. And he does so by that command. He bids you live. He bids you leave here this evening, this Easter Sunday evening, persuaded that this indeed is the reality, that he is risen from the dead, that he has uh, been pleased to come into our midst here this evening by his Spirit, speaking through his word and speaking to you that you may leave here a new person with that new, abundant, full, eternal life and live that life discovering the peace in the midst of your storms, the pleasure that there is in his presence and his love and his conversation and his leading and directing of you, the purpose that he has for you and the power that he gives to you. That's the life that he means you should leave here with this evening as you simply entrust yourself to him and say, Jesus, my Lord and my God, I'm yours. Count me in. I'm yours and I'm yours for the duration. Uh, may God use his word to do just that. Uh, nothing better marks an Easter Sunday than you're doing just that. The children's worksheets exhort them at the end of the, uh, uh, the, the worksheet to do just that, to entrust their lives to Jesus, to thank him for all that he is and has done, and to say, Jesus, I'm yours. And uh, whether you're a child or an adult, no matter what your circumstances, we simply do the same and we press on out from here. I always urge people to make sure you look up when you leave the building. You see that big round window at the top there. You look and right in the middle are those three words. That's the reality that you're going to live your life with from now on if you have Jesus in your life. God with us. That's what happens. You leave here and you leave here not on your own. You leave here with him, whatever you have to face, however hard it is, however sore it is, however sad it is, you leave here with him, you have God with you. And whatever's going to happen, um, it's, it's going to happen with him at work in you, through you, and for you. May God bless his word to that end. Lord, we thank you for uh, your word. Uh, thank you for the gift that you've given to us in your son our Lord Jesus Christ. And what a thrill it is for us always to know that he is risen and that the life that he gives to his people is one in which we know that abundance and that eternal life. And we pray, Lord God, please, for one another that according to our need, you would meet with us. You would apply that word. Some folk quite troubled, quite fearful, quite worried, would you simply speak that word of peace to them that they may hear you speaking those words, peace be to you, and, and have that word lodge in their hearts to dispel the fears, to dispel the worries. For those that are grieving, Lord, would you come with the comfort of your own presence? For those that are fearful, would you reassure them that nothing they have to face, they face on their own. You're going to be with them, and you're going to see them through it. You're going to walk them through it. You're going to protect them through it. You're going to provide for them through it. And for those, Lord God, who maybe just not quite sure where they're going in life, what it's all about, would you 
would you simply call them to yourself and give them that clarity of purpose? And those conscious of weakness, would you breathe afresh upon us that we might know that we, we don't leave here the same. We leave empowered mightily by your own Holy Spirit that we may press on and even in the face of death itself, be confident that the victory has already been won and has been given to all who trust in your Son. And this we ask for his namesake. Amen. Well, we close off our Easter Sunday worship by joining to sing together the hymn, Thine Be the Glory, Risen, Conquering Son. already accomplished and given to us and it's like the Lord says you, you don't need to bother with the final verse just get out there and live it and enjoy it so go in peace to love and to serve the Lord and we'll say together the words of our final prayer may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all amen <laughs>